So I think we should just start at the beginning. Um, again, I was telling Zach that I want to make this really personable too. Obviously, you guys are sneaker guys. So um, I think we should definitely start there and just talk about your, you know, who you are, where you're from, um, and then jump in and talk about like sneakers and how long you've been into them and what you collect. And then we can, and then we can get a little bit more serious, right? Sure. Sure. So I'm, I'm Eric. Uh, I, I live in New Jersey. Uh, I rep, I represent New Jersey pretty hard. Uh, so Good if level. you're ever in the area, let me know. Uh, I got into sneakers probably when I was in like high school, I started skateboarding and that's when sneakers became really important. You know, I was one of those people that growing up, you had like one pair of shoes a year, like for your school shoes. And that was it. But then when you start, when I started sk skateboarding, like a lot of it, uh, you know, it, the materials mattered, the design mattered. It, you started paying attention a lot more to quality and stuff. I fell off a little bit in college. And then uh, this past year, I kind of picked it back up again. I got a pair of New Balances. Yeah, I got a pair of X racers that just blew my mind. And I I kind of just got back into New Balance. And from there, I got, you know, into Instagram, devoted myself as a hobbyist to taking pictures and stuff like that, reached out to you, Dave, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of become a little bit of a, a passion project, just kind of finding sneakers that I like and, and, and collecting them, taking pictures and, and getting them, getting out there and using them. So I also met up with, uh, with Zach, who's an attorney. I'm also an attorney. I followed his, his page on Instagram and I was like, how the heck does this guy make any money off of sneakers? Like <laughs> sneaker law. And we got to talking and Zach is, he, he does, I do litigation mostly. So when it goes to court, that's when I get involved. Zach does trademark stuff on the front end so that your brand is protected. You know, he, he does all the, the stuff like that. I'll let him talk more about it, but like he does, he has a very complimentary skill set to what I do because I do things he doesn't and he does things that I don't. So it was cool talking to him and Instagram is such a like cool way to connect with people that, you know, he and I kind of hit it right off and we got to talking about a whole bunch of sneaker law stuff. So that's how we got here. Cool. Cool. And uh, Zach, obviously you got the wall behind you. Um, <laughs> you want to give us a little little quick background on on you and Sneaker Law Firm? Law firm. Yeah, no problem. Uh, just like Eric, just like you, just like everyone, I've, I've been into sneakers my whole life. Uh, I, we're probably around the same age. So I grew up in New York. Uh, my parents were artists. My mom went to Parsons and my dad went to FIT. So they've always been creative and sort of out there uh, in a way. And my mom always said that uh, when I was when I was born, she was working in a, in a shoe store. So <laughs> that's sort of how she said my first addiction to shoes became when I was in the womb. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so I, I love sneakers my whole life. Uh, and similar to Eric, you know, my parents didn't get me a million shoes like you see behind me. Uh, so I only had to have one and love it and care it and cherish it uh, throughout my whole life. Uh, then eventually when I got older, I started being able to actually get them myself. So that's when I started growing the collection uh, that you see behind me. Uh, but it really all just came organically, how I started working in sneakers and just my love and passion for sneakers. Uh, and as you know, uh, the sneaker industry has evolved uh, from our time when we would just go to the mall and Jordans would be sitting, uh, you know, same thing with dunks, you know, you know, the story and history behind those. Uh, and now there are bots, there are add to cart services, there are discord groups, there, you know, it, the industry has evolved. And I got involved just by out of necessity in, you know, when, when the first Yeezy V1s released, I wanted a pair, <laughs> just like everyone else, the turtle doves that I got behind me. Uh, and I bought my first pair and they were fake and I didn't know what to do. So just like everyone nowadays, you, you, do research and you go online, you find out what's going on and how do you get the real ones and, and you, you learn about the system. And in doing that, I met great people uh, in all areas of the industry from, you know, discords, bots, resellers, to online stores, to big people and big industries. And just by doing that and being an attorney and, you know, just being personable, I started making connections and started getting friends in the industry. And that's sort of how Sneaker Law Firm developed. 
uh, you know, just really organically. And it, it's a great thing because, you know, I was able to work at some big firms and some big companies and I always walk in in a suit the first day, the next day I'd be wearing Jordans and, you know, <laughs> off white and stuff. And everyone would just look at me weird from the sales team to the legal team. And to me, it was comfortable, uh, you know, and, and that's the most important thing. You could still be a good attorney and, and wear Jordans. Uh, yeah. So to me, it's just being yourself and being true. And it took some time for me to realize that there is this thing that Eric was talking about, that there's this thing called sneaker law, you know, and it's really no different than anything we've done for, for a long time. It's just applying the law and the principles that I do and that Eric does to the legal industry and to sneakers. And it's just blown up so much that, you know, it's, it's in the spotlight more. Um, and so, you know, obviously jumping, I'm going to jump right into it. So I do feel like, you know, there is a lot of legalese now that, that is involved in the sneaker world. And it, and it didn't, it didn't, it never felt like it needed to be there, you know, back in the day, because it was so like ground level, really organic. Everyone that was involved was sort of passionate, but now I think because there is a serious financial, you know, risk or, you know, benefit to sneakers, there are these like competing interests. And we've started to see that sort of evolve and become like a serious thing. And I, and I remember the first big sort of legal issue was when the original Babesters came out and people were like, ooh, that's an Air Force One, but like it doesn't have a swoosh. But there was never really a, a real legal, I don't know, outcome to that situation. Nike just sort of sort of washed over it, never really um, pursued anything that we know of. Um, but that was the first time that I ever really recognized that there was this line between, ooh, this, you know, this might be problematic. And I'm wondering for you guys, as lawyers, did you guys ever have that point where as a, just as a sneaker connoisseur, as a sneaker aficionado, you thought, man, this is questionable. Like this is a serious thing. People need to start thinking about this. Like, um, and when did that first hit? Yeah, uh, I can, I'll let Zach talk more about the, the, the babe stuff. Uh, that's really fascinating, but anytime anybody, my, my radar, initially went off whenever I saw anybody doing like the, 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 the tie dyeing or any sort of coloring on, on an existing sneaker and then reselling it as their own, you know, that to me is, is, you know, you're, you're profiting off of somebody else's trademark. Um, but things really, really got interesting recently with the little Nas thing, because I think that was, that was a, a case that really tests the limits of what is and is not um permissible and what you can and cannot do or what you should and should not do more importantly that that one really uh really got the most that the most attention um but you know legally it, it's it's such an interesting thing and it, when you when you get a product and you have it for yourself you can resell it but you know there's certain things that you can and can't do when when you when you alter it so um anytime you're making an alteration and then reselling it, it kind of triggers a little something in my head that's like okay there's something going on here uh zach you know you can kind of talk a little bit more about that yeah no, i think you hit the nail on the head as lawyers when we go to law school the most important skill they teach us is issue spotting uh and i sort of think it's, it's a good thing and it's a bad thing but to your point every time i see a new picture and you know, a Bapesta or something that comes out, I instantly am issue spotting and thinking, hey, that looks like this, that looks like this. And my lawyer brain goes off and I'm like, hmm, infringement, infringement. And <laughs> that might just be me as a lawyer, uh, you know, but at the same time, I think that happens to a lot of people, you know, once they see a shoe, the first thing that they think of is, hey, that looks like this, or that looks like that. And I mean, it's, it's, it's easy to make those side-by-side -side comparisons, but legally it's not the same. You know, the, the law isn't just saying, hold this up, next to each other and compare them like that you know there's more tests and there's factors and all this stuff and you know there's defenses and and each shoe is looked at in its in its own you know you can't compare a nike and a little nas and a nike and a this one you know the facts are all different for each one so it's really complex and it's really you know the, the test is 
really intense. But every time I see that, that's exactly what I think. I think, hey, infringement and my legal brain is going through those analysis and doing all that. And I think a lot of the sneaker community does the same thing. They think, hey, that looks like this or that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah so that can you talk more about the, the vape, vapesta? Um, yeah. Like, how was that? You know, how, how, how are they getting away with that? What's, yes. What's the deal? So it sort of goes into what you see all the time now. Uh, same thing sort of happens with the Air Jordan 1 silhouette, you know, uh, where essentially what the brands are doing is they're taking a silhouette and they're just slapping their own logo on it. Uh, and with Bape, it's a little different. Uh, essentially, they're doing the same thing. But the reason I say it's a little different is because, uh, you know, Nike owns certain patents and, and, and trademarks to and, and trade dress as well to the Air Force One and all these different uh, elements of the, the, the shoe. So from what I heard, the, the patent ran out on the on the Bape stuff or on the Nike's Air Force One, I think it was a year or two before that. So when they do that, it sort of opens up the, the, the levies. Nike still has a trade dress for the, uh, for the Air Force One. But as we see with all these factors and once with all the factors that you take in considering the court's decisions, uh, it's, it's almost not worth it to bring a lawsuit sometimes. So once they, if they own the trade dress, it still not, might not be worth it for them to bring a lawsuit because Nike has to defend it. Yeah. So it's always a, you know, it's, it's always a tough decision to say, hey, even if we own the IP, should we go after these people? Yeah. Uh, in the case of the Bapes, the Nike didn't. It, they didn't, I guess they didn't have a patent at the time uh, or the trade dress. So they didn't really have any, you know, a sword to, to, to go at them with in, in the law. So, so there's a couple thinking, things there. Dave, Dave, go ahead. I'm oh, sorry. no, I was yeah. just going to say, you know, as the lay person here, um, digging in a little bit, just can you sort of explain the difference between like the trade dress, the trademark and a patent? Yeah, no problem. So uh, in short, a trademark, according to the UP USPTO, it's a, a slogan, a brand, a word, a, a logo, uh, something like that, that when you see it, you could attribute it to a specific source. For example, if I see the McDonald's arches, I'm going to know that's McDonald's. Uh, and the, the important aspect of it is to point it to a specific source identifier so that you know what you're getting, the goods and services across the board. So if I'm looking for a Big Mac in the USA and I see the golden arches, I know that it's the same Big Mac that I get in China when I see the golden arches. And that's sort of, in, in a nutshell, what the trademark laws are trying to uh, accomplish. Uh, throwing that to the Nike Satan situation, uh, if you know if if you see the Satan shoe and it has a swoosh on it, you're gonna think, hey, Nike inspected it, they checked it, they okayed it, they you know they uh, they okay they approved it, but they didn't. Uh, someone put blood in it, and you know there's all these weird factors. So Nike didn't want to be associated with that because who knows whose blood was in it? Who knows? You know, there's there's a lot of other areas like that. Uh, but that's what trademark addresses, sources, source identifying for logos and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, another aspect is trade dress. Uh, and that applies to shoes because trade dress is sort of the design uh, related to the shoes or some sort of packaging or, or the actual silhouette of the shoe itself. But the standard for trade dress is totally different than the standard for trademark. And it's a lot harder to get. You have to prove that that shoe has acquired distinctiveness. Uh, which takes time. Mm -hmm. uh, so using, I'll, I'll go right to it. The Air Jordan, the Jordan 1 is an example. Came out in 85. We all know that. Or, or I think, you know, 84 technically, but it wasn't officially released till 85. Uh, Nike just applied for a trade dress for the Jordan 1 high and low silhouette last year in 2020. Uh, some people are saying, why'd they wait, whatever, 35 years? You know, it doesn't make sense. But at some, you have to wait some time to show that it's acquired distinctiveness in the market. And then everyone points to it and says, hey, that's a Jordan one. Uh, a, a bad thing about doing that is if people are ripping it off and copying it, you, you have to enforce that, you know? Otherwise, it's gonna happen, what's gonna happen is sort of what happened to Timberland. Uh, Timberland tried to get a trade dress in the boot, the classic Timberland boot that all of us have, uh, and was denied by the USPTO because they didn't acquire distinctiveness because everyone started copying it. <laughs> you know, I had three fake Timberland boots growing up myself. Uh, so that's sort of the a scary thing here where, you know, you, you have to show that you've acquired distinctiveness to get a trademark. And it's really hard to do that. Uh, and, and sometimes, you know, they don't want to take the risk there. And then when they do, for example, with the Air Force One, because Nike has a trade dress, 
Uh, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to frivolously, frivolously attack people with it because all they have to do is turn it around and say, hey, you, you shouldn't have that. And then you have to prove yourself all over again. Uh, an example of that was with the Air Force One in a case called Yummy, where Nike or yeah, where they almost lost the Air Force One trade dress. Uh, so keeping with the intellectual property theme, we have the trademarks, we have trade dress. And then another one that applies to sneakers is a, a, a patent. Uh, most it's either a design or utility patent. Uh, usually it's a design and the shape. But yeah, as you see, without getting too legally and nerdy on you, there's all these different areas of uh, the law that could apply to one sneaker. So yeah. the best thing is to get protection in all the areas so that no one could copy them and you could sue them and protect, you know, protect your, your rights. So Zach, if I'm, if I'm understanding correctly, patents, patents generally apply to the physical object, right? So it, it's more the, sh the patent applies to the shoe itself and, and the design and materials of the shoe. The trademark is kind of your logo. So it's the Nike swoosh, it's the, the Nike font. And then trade dress is the silhouette. So there's, is, am, I, am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, exactly. In short, you sort of had that, you pretty much trade dress. Uh, trade dress is like you said, the design or the, the packaging, you know, different areas. For example, trade dress, uh, what is it? Uh, the color, you could have uh, a trade dress in the Louboutin, you know, the, the bottom yeah. sole. Uh, but trademark, like you said, is for words or logos. And patents are not for specific physical, they're usually in physical items, but they're really for inventions, you know? Right. Uh, a great example of this is Crypto Kicks. Nike has a design, uh, a utility patent, I'm sorry, for Crypto Kicks, which is the system to create an NFT and a digital sneaker and, and all that. Uh, they haven't used it yet, but they have a patent in it because they've wrote the process down and explained it and applied for that uh, with the USPTO. Do they also have a, a, a patent for like the, the Air Max bubble or something I'm like that? Sure. I, I, I'm, I'm, I know they do have uh, something for that. I don't know. Because I know patents expire after some yeah. point. So that's why I say that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're right. And that's, Dave, that's the other thing is that, so one thing I wanted to bring up is that in order for you to have a, a, a like a, a viable trademark, you have to protect it. You can't, you have to, not only must you acquire that distinctive character, you also must go out there and enforce your, your brand. So if anybody's infringing upon it, you, it's your obligation to, to kind of protect your brand or else your brand is diluted and, and then people can just start using it and they can use that as an affirmative defense against you. Right, Zach? Yeah, exactly. It's sort of tricky to me. You're right. The weird thing to me is that the trademark uh, registration process takes time. And to get a silhouette, to acquire distinctiveness, you have to have some time to do that. So it's weird to me, and you, you'd understand this better as a litigator, if you don't have a, a federal registered trademark, like Nike doesn't have for the Air Jordan 1 right now, how are you gonna enforce it if you don't have a trademark? You know, are, yeah. are you gonna use those common law rights, which you know aren't as strong as the federal Definitely. right? So like, that's what I'm saying. If, if for example, using Timberland, the, the court said, or the, the board said, no, you didn't enforce those rights. There's a bunch of other people who copied the Timberland logo. What is Timberland supposed to do? Use common law rights and say, hey, that looks like ours and, and lose the case? Yeah. So, Not only, so Dave, I want to unpack that a little bit. Um, well, common yeah. law rights are really, uh, so there's, what we're talking about here is federal trademark uh, protection. What that means is that with that protection, when you have a trademark with like the Nike swoosh, you can go in any any jurisdiction in the United States and and probably abroad too, I'm sure, and you can enforce your rights anywhere. But when you're relying on the common law, then you have to you have to go state by state, and 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 it's a much harder process for you to 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 enforce. Not only that, you also must prove from the get go that you have that that you know that trademark. So it's it's you definitely want the the trademark protection from from the get go, and you want the federal trademark protection. But there are state laws that can apply um, on a case by case basis. But it's a very complicated system, and and it's it's something that you want to get it right ahead of time because if you find yourself in trouble or you you find your brand you know being diluted by somebody else, then it's you know it's much harder for you to 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 reclaim your brand, you know? 
It makes sense though. And like, I like the, I like the example, Zach, that you made about the Louis, Louis Vuitton with the, the red sole, right? So if you think about a Louis Vuitton, um, that red sole is distinctive, but it's not something that no one could technically do, but it's one of those identifiers that exists, right? So like, it's, it's something that's readily identifiable, but it's not something that someone necessarily designed as if similar to a swoosh. So there's that like differential, right? Between something that you actually created and no one else technically uses where you design, you used art and you, you know, created a logo or you created an image versus, hey, I'm gonna slap this, this color like Tiffany blue, where, you know, Tiffany blue is very distinctive and you see it and you immediately think, oh, Tiffany, or you see the red sole and you immediately think, oh, Louboutin. Um, and it's immediately recognizable sort of like the world over or within a certain jurisdiction as opposed to like navy blue. Navy blue is just navy blue. Everyone sees navy blue all the time. You don't think of a specific brand or a specific, um, you know, a specific characteristic or company when you see navy blue. So I think that makes a lot of sense to, to me. And so I guess diving down the rabbit hole a little bit. I, I, I sort of gave you guys a little bit of an outline talking about sort of the history of customizations, right? So I think for me, the, the difficulty in understanding where the little Nas X situation went off the rails. And I know you guys, you kind of talked about, Zach, you kind of talked about like, where's the blood coming from? Like Nike has no sort of understanding or ownership of that. And so I want to start a little bit farther back before we get to the little Nas X situation and talk about people like shoe surgeon and people like Mosh, right? So I think when I think customizers, I think about them, but they haven't been under as much fire for creating these different distinct silhouettes, right? And so shoe surgeon, perfect example, he is creating products that have a swoosh, right? He's it's not a Nike created swoosh. It's a swoosh that he he creates out of a separate different material and then either slaps it on or creates like a whole silhouette on a Nike, you know, Air Jordan 1 or some other silhouette or sole. So how has that been perceived and how do you guys, where do you guys see that in, in, in terms of the line? So I, I'd like to go first because I have no idea where the line is and i'd like zach <laughs> to give me some sort of an idea but here's my gut instinct um the more that you are putting your own labor into the shoe and your own unique perspective on it the more likely it is for it to be considered custom versus infringing um you know when it, it's there are times when I think to myself, okay, this is, this is mass produced. There's, you know, this isn't, this is machine made. This is, this is clearly not, um, not custom custom in the way that I think about it, but perhaps there is some artistic merit to it or some, some meaningful, you know, change to it. The problem is that all of that really has no, that's all well and good, but it has no legal basis. Like, I, the, I, I think that the, the, the legal line is really, from my perspective, if you are replicating the same design on the same shoe and selling it for profit, then it is infringing. That's my opinion. But that's, that's, that, that's that could be you're you're getting close to infringing like if, you, if you're just trying to if, if you're if you're replicating the same thing and you're doing it the same way and you're marketing it as if you're marketing it as that kind of shoe then then you're getting then you're really getting close to an infringing product um but you know i, I the question is really also enforcement and zach keep me in check because i think that my legal basis is is kind of off here um because I, kn I know it can't be that harsh but i think the letter of the law sometimes can be harsh yeah no i think you hit the nail on the head that really is the issue here 
there is no clear line. <laughs> I mean, you know, Eric, as an attorney, there's barely ever a clear line. But the question is, what is a custom? What's the definition of a custom? What's the def definition of a counterfeit? You know, uh, I mean, I could tell you my opinion or my definition and, you know, based on the law, but just what we talked about earlier, there's all these tests and there's seven factors here and all this and all that. And that's really what it comes down to. If it's a if it's a custom or if it's a commercial product or this or that. So do you have, do you have the factors? I mean, I can look them up if you have, if you don't. I don't have it in front of me now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, in short, what it comes down to is once you own the trademark, uh, yeah. you know, the, the logo or the name Nike or the swoosh, you have the ability to say yes or no to others if they could use it. So if you're a custom shoe person uh, and you like the shoe surgeon, and because he takes authentic Nike products. If he's using, if he's going to create a, you know, a brand new Air, Air Jordan 1 Travis Scott, he's going to spend whatever, thousands of dollars and use an actual real Nike shoe. So that's why I think Nike likes him because he never talks bad about him. He doesn't put blood in his shoes. He spends the money and gets real, uh, you know, real shoes. And he's using an official shoe. You're right. It does have the Nike logos and such on them. Uh, but according to the first sale doctrine, that's an exception to trademark infringement, to you selling Nike's trademarks without their permission, you know, which, which is what he does, yeah. uh, you know, but the question is if he's materially altering those shoes a lot. And again, the definition of that could be, you know, just putting a, a little red dot on it, putting a smiley face on it to totally making it a, a new shoe. When he materially alters that, then, you know, he can't really use the, the first sale doctrine as an exception to trademark infringement. Right. So right. then he says, okay, it's a work of art now. You know, now it's, it's, a, it's a work of art, you know, so now I'm protected under First Amendment or now I'm protected under some other avenue of law because it's, it's, it's transformative. And that's where it gets into all the factors and all the an analysis that, that okay. in these court cases, because it's like, is this transformative? Uh, using Satan, the Satan shoe, they only put a little bit of writing on it. They injected some blood in it. You know, is that transformative? I don't know. Compare that to you know, a shoe that I just purchased a couple of days ago, uh, uh, yeah. the Mache. I'm literally writing a piece about this now. It's it's this tie, it's an impression, literally an impressionistic art piece on yeah. a sneak. Each one is one of one. You're not going to get the same shoe. It's not going to have blue here. It's not going to have blue there. All 665, 66 Satan shoes said the same thing. They all look the exact same thing. So when the court analyzes that, my opinion is that, hey, that's a commercial product. You could do that in a factory. It's all right. the same thing. You're not having an artist doing a one of one or you know making it different so right. it's really a crazy test when you think of it like all that and every shoe has to be looked at in itself and the facts of each shoe so that, going, that's my take on it at least going back just kind of going back a little bit to sort of your original point where you talked about brand dilution and um sort of like the thinking about the the logo and how other people were, will use it and so you think about Timberland and you go back to that example that you use. Okay, so people are using Timberland um, logo or making riffs off of it. And so that diluted the Timberland brand. And so that made the Timberland brand not as valuable. But you think about someone like Shoe Surgeon and what he's doing. And it almost seems like he's not diluting the Nike brand. He's actually elevating it, right? So like, you know, he's creating product from Nike product that's more valuable. So in essence, he's he's making he's creating, you know, a, a higher a higher brand value for Nike in a way. So why would they go against that? So that in my mind, that's what I'm thinking. And so that you know, when you think about like the Satan shoe, yes, like it yeah. does seem kind of like okay, yeah, I just injected some red dye and blood into the heel and into the air bubble and you know put some writing on it. And I'm charging more, but am I getting more for the value? Am I creating this more valuable product? And maybe from maybe because they were able to sell them all and you know they were limited, like I guess yes, but at the same time, as a product, it's not more valuable because it's not necessarily that much more of a product. Well, well, here's I I want to just take it back a little bit to, to Zach's kind of analysis, which is, you know, okay, once you make a material alteration, you're in the potential of infringement zone. 
However, then your your defense becomes okay. It's it's an artistic piece, so that's kind of the the framework that that the little Nas case was was existing in. They took the the uh, Air Maxes and they they did their material alterations to them, and then they sold them very expeditiously, which worked to their advantage in this case. Um, <laughs> But the question is, you know, what is the value of those material alterations? And the, that, that really depends upon a number of things. You know, how much do you like Lil Nas? How much do you like, how, how much do you like Nike? How much do you like collabs? Um, how, much, how much do you like the controversy surrounding it? It, it, the, are you one of the 665 that, that got it? You know, the, those kind of things. And th the reason that I love this case is that it is, it, it's, it really tests the limits of what can be considered art because the shoe itself is, is part of a larger piece of art. So the, the Lil Nas had this, he said he, in one of his tweets, he said he had seven months to prepare for it, for the drop. And I'm sure that he, they planned this drop out expecting Nike to sue and expecting Nike to, to come at them because Nike fell right into their trap, in my opinion. And they, they, didn't, they, they didn't do one thing that I think they could have done that potentially could have stopped it. And I'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. But basically, you know, this is Lil Nas... The, the video, the song, the controversy himself, you know, it's a, it's a very, it's, it's an expression of himself and it's an artistic expression. The song dropped with the shoe. The shoe has implications in and of itself, but then you throw Satanism on top of that. And that has religious implications too, from both the Christian as well as the, the, the Satan, Satanistic side. So there's just a lot to unpack and it's a huge piece of quote unquote art, which makes this so much more complicated for a court to have to decide, which is why I really wanted to see the hearing that was supposed to happen, but we, but it settled before we could. Um, you know, but in, in your typical case, the question of what is the value of, of the alterations, that, that's one that really is, you know, in the eye of the beholder. Um, you know, that, that's, that's always the question. I'm curious to hear what you're going to say. We should jump to that now. You're the litigator, so you know. <laughs> <laughs> the art side is very interesting to me because yeah. I think um, as a person that works with artists, you know, consistently, I'm always... I'm always like questioning, okay, you know, you made, you painted this painting, right? So you did one of one versus, hey, I, I made this painting and now I'm going to do a bunch of prints of them. So I, I, I think for me, I'm always, I'm always thinking of this lens of, okay, is it art if you mass produce it, right? Because, because, okay, I have Space Jam ones, right? There's like a million of those. Is it still art? Like I, I personally love that too, right? But is it art because it's mass produced on this huge high level and there's not like, I don't know, like I, I feel like the time invested and the personal effort and the story and everything else has to accumulate to make something feel like a piece of art versus, hey, I made a sandwich. Is that a piece of art, right? It's one of one. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I, so, totally, like, I don't know like there's that that line oh man yeah and I and I totally agree with you I think the number of you know the number definitely matters you know if you're making 100,000 or if you're making 666 if you're making one it, it definitely you know is something to consider it's just so it's just that's what makes this case interesting because it's such a tricky you know it's such a tricky thing to analyze because uh using one of my favorite artists Daniel Arsham you know he makes yeah. Yeah. cool little pieces and he'll still do limited series he'll do a 500 thing drop you know but to me that's still art you know they're all the same but that's still art you know but if you compare that to a shoe like the little not satan thing maybe i wouldn't call that as much you know but but again they're, they're different everything so it's just a you know it's a tricky thing because where do you draw where do you draw the line is there a specific number that turns it into a commercial product versus 
an actual art piece or is it the content? Uh, in this situation, just what Eric was saying, they were sort of using the yin and the yang, the, the, the Satan shoe and then the Jesus shoe that they dropped yeah. you know, last year and sort of comparing them as a whole, you know, uh, what's it called? A critique on collab culture, specifically yeah. Nike. The fact that they do collabs with everyone, you know? Mm -hmm. So if you sort of look at it like that, it's a masterpiece. It's like, holy crap, they've been thinking about this for two years. They've been planning this, like, it's it's so sophisticated if you think yeah. of it. I'm sure we could go on some conspiracy theory, kind of <laughs> find out all this stuff, but it's intense, you know? So does yeah. that mean it's art, you know? Uh, who, who knows? So and, the, yeah, yeah. I, I think I think you have to I, I think hopefully the law considers this, but you have to look at the 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 thing in in the context. You have to look at the object in the context of of the the original sale, the the transformative uh, uh, way of of making the transformation, and then the meaning that's behind it, and and then the meaning that's that the the end end user or consumer has. Uh, for it you know like you have to look at i think i think courts and i think people you have to look at at things in their context and and not everything is black and white and there are shades of gray and and i think that you know the from a technical standpoint the the satan shoes were infringing infringing in my opinion they 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 you know, they didn't transform the shoe enough to make it a custom, in my opinion. And the only reason that I want to get into the, the technical technicalities about it a little oh, bit, wow. but the only reason that those shoes didn't get completely recalled or, or prevented from, from um, being sold is that they were so quick about it. And there's a little thing called personal jurisdiction. So Zach, I know, represents some people that or represent some people that may have had concerns about um, the Satan shoes, but in order for them to be joined in a case uh, with Nike, they would have to be personally served with the with with a lawsuit. So, in order to get personal jurisdiction over everybody that received those 665 pairs of shoes, you'd have to personally serve every single person that received them. And Nike doesn't even have that order information. Yeah. At the at the outset, yeah. so you know, like the, not, from the get go, as soon as I heard that that uh, the the Satan shoes had reached their destinations, I knew that there was no way a recall was possible. Like it, a voluntary one is the best that you're going to get because mm -hmm. you, you once people have the the thing in their in their possession, to get that back is extremely extremely hard. So. You know, I went off on a tangent, but uh, you know, I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> no, it was really good. I, I, I'm, I'm curious to, to, to dive into this a little bit more, um, and sort of talk about other sort of mass-produced shoes, right? That Nike, because it seems like Nike's been on a, they've been on a little bit of a rampage, right? So, uh, you got Warren Lotus a few months ago, and I mean, I don't think, for me, I was like duh no brainer like yes ab ab absolutely that was like you know crossing the line um and then you know i think they just went after air key or cool key um who does like the custom air jordan ones but they're not custom they're just like they're air jordan ones but they have i think it's a star swoosh or something um on them and but it's an air jordan one it just it looks like an air jordan one same colorways He's just change. He just you know he's having them mass produce and he just changed the, the you know the the logo on them. So they've just he just got sued. So I feel like that, Nike is like sort of like okay now I really have to protect my brand. Yeah, you're exactly right. I don't know if I heard the same thing. I think it was Hip Hop News or one of these uh media outlets reported that Air Kai had been sued. Yeah. Uh, by Nike, but I looked, I've been looking for a while because that's been in the news a lot and I couldn't find anywhere that it was actually confirmed. Yeah, I didn't see, I didn't see that either, but I, I did see that they had, or maybe, I don't know. So I don't, no, you're I don't right, know you're right. It's, it's, it's out there. You're exactly right. It's out there and it, it hits on the same thing, you know, yeah. what are people doing with these night Air Jordan 1 silhouettes and just slapping their own logo on, you know, it, so it, you're exactly right. It, it, it's, it's been happening a lot and especially with Warren Lotus, they just took you know, the dunk logo, or he even took the exact dunk shoe with the swoosh and put a smiley face. So 
So yeah, it's, it's been in the news and Nike's, you know, they're, they're ramping it up and it, it looks like, from my opinion, Nike owns the world, you know, <laughs> they're one of the greatest <laughs> companies that have a, a really good reputation. They're doing their thing. So what more can they do? Uh, you know, they don't want to spread to, they don't have anywhere else to spread. So they're going to try <laughs> to divorce their marks and enforce everything. Yeah. So. <laughs> eh, I'm not a big fan of Nike. I mean, I know you're Mr. New Balance, and I love New Balance yeah. too. <laughs> I'm just speaking, generally speaking. I mean, I mean, as a company, world. as a company, they are a behemoth, and you know, the the thing about any sort of public company when they get to that size is that it, it, they're all beholden to shareholders at the end of the day. You know, it, it's it's really. If, unless you're a private company and even then you probably are anyway but like you have to it's all about the bottom line and the question is how do you how do you make that bottom line and, and i think new balance's approach is much different than nike's new balance is is on fire and and they're 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 not as they don't own the market like nike does but you know they are taking a different approach the at the the very the problem with with nike is that the hype just doesn't match the quality it's just the quality is the quality is is what you buy a product for and and it you know it's just not it's not there and the way that they maximize their their dollar the way that they satisfy their shareholders i think is is making it a lower quality product whereas some other companies are doing different things and that's just my opinion you know uh, nike has questionable commercial practices as well with you know the way that they um uh, they, they've had a history of of um you know uh going outsourcing their their labor and you know not not doing it in the most reputable way um but you know i don't want to make this about nike uh nike nike is a juggernaut nike is a juggernaut and they need to defend their brand but you know it, that you're absolutely right zach it's a, it's a fine line finding that balance between filing frivolous lawsuits and 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 you know actually protecting your your brand i know somebody i know somebody that had their their brand taken away from them by a, a popular figure um that had nothing to do with this person just because that person needed to enforce their brand and, and it's you know it's it's a it's a it's a tricky situation but it happens a lot and, you know yeah yeah um, sorry <laughs> no i i think i think it's i think it's worthwhile to talk about um the quality of the product and if that affects how people are able to navigate so Jordan, you know, obviously Nike puts out a Jordan one or they put out, let's say they put out an Air Max one. And, you know, I think there's been a lot of complaints about the quality of, of the bacon, the air bacon that just re recently dropped, right? So um, there's been a lot of inconsistencies from, you know, different, different pairs. And so my question or my thought is, if I make my own bacon and I, you know, make 600 pairs, but the quality is that much higher, right? Is how does that how does that affect and and what and what impact and what how do how do you think about that if you're a big brand like Nike? Are you thinking, oh well, now these pairs are out there, they're gonna help perpetuate or sell or increase the value of the product that we make, or is it hurting? Is it diluting what we already are producing um, because it's because it's better quality. And so it's detracting from, from our popularity. Yeah, to me, and I'm sort of putting my lawyer hat on again. It, I mean, it sort of depends on the logos and stuff. And I'll sort of tie this into the bootlegs and the customs that we see. But because to be honest, all, not all, most of the customs that I get from, you know, clients, friends, every, everyone that I see are better quality than Nike stuff. You know, Eric's right. You know, Nike sometimes doesn't have the, the best quality and it's, you know, becoming more evident. And because of that, people are leaving Nike for New Balance. I mean, even me, I've grown a New Balance Connect collection and a lot of other people, <laughs> a lot of other people are, you know, creating their own brands and they're getting Italian leather and going to good places. Warren Lotus is one of them. Uh, ever since the lawsuit, it sort of put him in the spotlight. But now if you follow his Instagram, anytime he does a shoe, he walks you through the process of what it looks like, where his factory is from, mm -hmm. what the leather looks like. So the quality, you know, for other brands, 
are, are getting better. You know, Nike needs to pay attention to that. And I guess what I was talking about previously was their enforcement strategy. And that was sort of the legal strategy where I didn't think they could grow the brand bigger. So I thought their next strategy was to enforce it. But maybe they should take a little less out of enforcement and put more into their materials and try and get better quality. Because in my opinion, and I've seen a lot of people who get these brand new shoes, like you said, with the Bacons, and you'll see glue. And I mean, I, I got a pair of Dunks last month and there was glue stains and there was a lot messed up. So if people are going to spend money on resale. I mean, resale shoes are crazy now, you know, thousands. People are going to spend thousand dollars on a shoe. Why would you do that if there's flaws in it? And you could just get a UA, an unauthorized authentic from the same factory in China for half the price. And that's sort of what people are saying. I mean, there's a whole market out there of UAs and people love UAs and, and it's crazy. And, you know, it really is the, the question of, do we go for the Nike because it has the swoosh or do we actually care about what the shoe is, what it's made out of? Zach, I have a question for you. Uh, where where does the line, and I guess going, Dave, you know, making a higher quality Nike would be awesome. And, you know, I would love to get my hands on a high quality pair of Bacons. Um, but, you know, uh, I'll, I'll wait until you, you make it. Um, I, I guess my question is... No promises. <laughs> my, my question is, uh, when does when does a brand become so ubiquitous that it's not even like they can't enforce it? You know, like Adidas is so is so the three stripes so so common. It's like wh- nobody should be violating it. I don't think anybody does. Like, why isn't the swoosh just like that? That should be public domain. I think you know, like it's, it's almost so. It's Nike means the swoosh and you know uh, also the swoosh can mean something else like it, it doesn't necessarily like why why just can you explain that for me a little bit like how can it be so protected even though it's it's so familiar to everybody so it's sort of i'll, I'll, I'll sort of step back a little bit. the a general misconception about trademarks in general is if you own that trademark you own it in the entirety, the whole thing, you know, Nike doesn't own the word Nike in every avenue, period, you know, it only owns it in the goods and services that it does. Uh, For example, uh, Dove, Um, you know, there's a Dove soap, and there's a Dove candy bar, they both, you know, they both could have the same trademarks, and they both coexist, but they're different goods and services and such. So it's, it's a common misconception that Nike owns the world and all this. And, because they really don't, you know, they only own the specific trademarks and their specific, you know, brands of, of goods and services that they do. Uh, so it's sort of a misconception about that. But at the same time, they have so much money that they could enforce it and they could scare people away from it. Uh, if you look in the trademark system, people file Nike for automotive, for car parts and all this other stuff. And Nike opposes that. And, and, then, and that's really what happens. Nike has such so much money. They have a big sword and they could, you know, use it however they want really uh because is there a way for guys like dave to to make a a nicer nike just utilizing that that symbol but but you can't do that because that's the whole purpose of trademark law like if you own that trademark you're the only one who decides who could use it you got to get your permission you got to do all this it makes sense it would be i mean and then i guess that stepping back a further thing if dave wants to make a shoe for himself you could do whatever the heck you want. That's the first sale doctrine. You know, if I, if I want to take this bacon here, Eric, and I want to write Eric's bacon, you know, Virgil does it. Virgil, you know, he writes his name on a shoe. If I want to make this and I could sell this to you, I could do that. You know, it, it, it's a one of one. Like, I don't think anyone will be wrong with that. That's, there's no confusion there. You know, that's mm-hmm. what the trademark stuff comes down to. Likelihood of confusion as to the source. So, I mean, if you're doing it on a small level, if you're doing it just for one person or for yourself personally, uh, like Dave, then you could do that. Or if you flip the swoosh around or sort of make it a parody or make it funny about it, like a play on Nike, then you could probably do that. But any other use of that swoosh, that's the whole purpose of the trademark laws. And they go forever. Unlike patents, trademarks, as long as you're using them, you could have a trademark forever. Oh, that, that's, that's, that's the difference. Yeah. yeah, Patents. That's why. And I think I knew that, but you know, I, it's so funny. I have I have one client that's a, a bus company, and 
every time I see a bus, I see their symbol. And, I, and it's not because they're the only bus company. It's just because that's the symbol that I notice. And I associate, like, it's just, like, they're, they're a big bus company, but like, they, they have that forever. And I've seen their, their buses going back to the 1950s in movies and stuff like that. Like, it, it's, you know, at a certain point, it just doesn't make sense for anybody to try to use it. But at the same time, like, it's 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 very interesting that you can you can own a symbol for that long as long as you're using it there is there is a very small area that's that says if you own something and it becomes so generic then you right. can lose it you know uh, i think was it kleenex uh, that, i don't think that happened to them but it was very close to happening where you know anytime you need a tissue you call it a kleenex that was my question so they had to do a special branding and marketing campaign. I swear they spent a lot of money branding and marketing to make sure they held on to that trademark so that people wouldn't say, give me a Kleenex every single time they met, give me a tissue. Huh. It, it's crazy. Wow. Interesting. Interesting. And, and so like going the other way, where, where is that? You, you kind of talked about like, if you wanted to do a one-off and have that for yourself or a one-off and sell that, um, is that protected? You said that's protected under... As, as like a work of art or is that something separate? Well, I, mean, I guess I would, you could make an argument under the first sale doctrine uh, that once you purchase a, a, a product from a store, a Nike, a Champs or anything, uh, you have the right to do what you want with it. Uh, you know, meaning I could sell it, but then that's where, it, you know, if you materially alter it too much and it's sold commercially, then you get in trouble. But if you're doing what you said, if I just take one shoe and do what I want to it and sell it to one person, you're fine. I don't think that, you know, that's not the purpose of the trademark trademark laws. And Nike's certainly not going to come after you. What about, what about New Balance? <laughs> what do you think about the, the New Balance brand? The, the, uh, their N is that, is, is that even trademarkable? The N? Yeah, actually, it's funny. I was just about to post one today. They just, uh, they just filed a new trademark for the, one of the newer, I think it was well, the one you have. Hold that up again. Is it the 327? Is that 327? No, this, I don't even know what this is, to be honest. This is, this is a unisex one. I actually just got this the other day. I, I was on newbalance.com and I had some rewards points and I was just like, screw it, man. It's a, it's a, it's a unisex shoe. It has red on the out, outside and so that, it might be like a 247 or a 274. 720. It says UL720SP. But I'm not. I don't even know the, the The only way I could tell is because in the uh, <laughs> I saw a picture in the trademark filing. It had a weird backs, and they actually they show you the picture of the actual shoe. So it's cool to, to look at the trademark. Oh filing. yeah. But they just filed. Every time you do a different version of that N, they have to file a new application. So New Balance owns the NB, and they own a different variation of this, and they own that, and they just filed a new one for that slanted N that, that you have right there. Yeah. Like last month. <laughs> Uh, so, but what's crazy about the New Balance, and I'll jump into the New Balance case, uh, there's a case in China that just, I think it was February, it got settled, where for whatever reason, New Balance didn't apply to trademark the New Balance logo in China. And another company, a third party, did. So New Balance was fighting them to get that trademark canceled. Uh, and essentially, it was this, it's the same word, New Balance, but just in, in their language. And the court said no. And it's a, I don't even know the test there. It's called the, the Doctrine of Foreign Equivalence. It's a very technical test, but long story short, New Balance doesn't own the New Balance logo in China because of it. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> or at least at this point. So it's crazy. That's interesting. And so going back to the swoosh, I hate going back to Nike, but the swoosh, right? So like the different variations of the swoosh, because we've seen over the years, like we've seen them make like Swiss cheese logos and all kinds of things. Now, every time they put the swoosh on something, if there's a variation on it, does it have to be changed or does it have to be trademarked? And then also, and this is a second part to that question, the material differences. So, you know, if I make a swoosh out of out of a diamond, like is that is that is that an infringement? Yeah, you're right. So any it, I guess it depends how they apply it is it a copyright is it a trademark but every time you tweak that logo you're gonna have to you know apply for a new trademark uh so the word you could when you apply for a trademark you could do it as a standard character mark 
which gives you more protection, or you can do it as the actual design. And what we're talking about with the, the logo, and then you know how Nike writes the swoosh and they'll write Nike on it. And they'll have a swoosh and they'll say Nike Air. And then like you said, they'll put Swiss cheese on it and they'll flip it upside down for the Sean Witherspoon. So this the guy. Logo, different logo, yeah. So depending on what Nike wants to do, if they want to protect that, they're going to have to file a new application every time. Oh, yeah. man. I, the only one that I care about is the Sakai. I want a pair of those shoes so bad. Am I pronouncing that right? The Sakai's? Yeah. That's awesome. Oh, my God. I want a pair of those so bad. And I just, I, I saw they're going to drop another one, but uh, I, I've never been lucky on it yet. So um, I love them because they make me a couple inches taller. They're oh, yeah. <laughs> do you have a pair? Uh, I got them on resale. Yeah, I got one pair. I had to, man. They're great. I got to get a pair. I got to get a pair. That's yeah. the one pair of Nikes that I, that I'm like, I, I need to have is I, I need a, I need a vapor waffle. I, I need I need a pair. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> They're worth it, man. They're really comfortable. Are they? I'm, I'm a big fan of like that tennis shoe style, you know, like just standard kind of tennis shoe. Yeah. And then that, that interesting heel is, is, is a, it just grabs the eye. And it's it's cool. It, it's, it's your style. Cool. I can see it with that new belt. Yeah. Yeah, all right, all right. So let's get off of law for a second. Dave, you have one shoe to bring with you on a desert island. What is it? I don't know what's on the desert island. <laughs> I mean, all right. So <laughs> you, it's a Dave and Buster's on a day on a desert island. Oh well, there you go. <laughs> so you, it's you, it's really choose your own adventure. Uh, how long am I stuck on that? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, it's, it's a difficult question because, um, I don't know. I think I face this, this question every day, right? Like what, yeah. what am I going to wear? So, um, I'm, I'm very partial at the moment to the 991, uh, New Balance 991s. And I'd probably go gray. I'd probably go with the the anniversary pair because I really like oh, that they're so versatile. I can just wear it with anything. What's the difference between the anniversary pair? You guys would know better than me than and just the regular. Is it just they put the anniversary on it or I, I have no clue. 30th anniversary. Yeah. So, 30th so anniversary. There's a, it says 2001, which is the year oh, that the 991 first released. And then it has it's it's sort of like a a new buck suede on the outside, whereas the traditional gray. 991 is is gray it's like people have a traditional gray yeah you're right i just got one of my first pair that's why i'm interested my first 991s so like I, you can see the difference gray. you can kind of see the difference in the grays uh, yeah oh, um and this is like a traditional sort of this is a 992 but this is a traditional like gray pair and so the suede is like a little bit more textured um than this which is you know it's not textured it's like new so um i like the 992 better than the 991 really i yeah, i'm gonna go ahead and say it i'm not i'm not i you know what like i i know they're really big right now i know people have been sort of into them but i'm kind of regretting all the pairs i bought except for like you, dude, you, you, oh man <laughs> i you have guys, eric what do you think uh, he's his his size is too big i, I was yeah, gonna ask you <laughs> yeah i like that i wanted to get those oh, those paperboy the paperboy paris pairs the 992s yeah those so freaking hot like i want a pair of those so bad I'll, I'll probably get them resale eventually they're nice but they're i mean they're i the the difficulty for me with new balance is that all of the collaborations that they've released within the past year were at one point something you could just go make on their mv1 so that's true i'm just sort of waiting for them to bring that back but i kind of feel like they're not going to bring it back because if you can go make whatever you want then it kind of takes away from their ability to sell you a collaboration yeah. and so um i mean it's kind of like nike 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 does sort of the same thing where they block off certain colors and things which is which is also which is fine but like I mean, I think for for people that are really into New Balance, I don't care about like a collaboration. Like Paperboy doesn't isn't a name that like really moves me. It's just like okay, that's cool. It's a collaboration. This colorway is really cool, but like 
I can go make my own colorway. If I can do that, it doesn't really matter to me. Yeah. I hope the NB1 comes back, but I, I doubt it. I doubt it. You're right. Because you're right. I mean, if you can make whatever you want, then I would just sit there playing with 991s, 992s. Oh, man. That, 2002s. That's my shoe right now. The 2002 R is that's that's my desert island shoe right now. You're uh, so comfortable. It's, it's perfect for I, I walk a lot. It's perfect for heavy walking. It's got great traction. I have a pair in suede, and it's the most comfortable suede I own. It's yeah, beautiful, beautiful. So, stuff. so you're telling me if you could get that same shoe, the Salehi one, orange 202, without his name on it, Salehi same everything else same color same everything you would do that Absolutely. for 140 bucks yeah. yeah 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 i guess you're right in that situation i would too it's just weird when you say that because i'm thinking of the nike by you and the dunks you know when people did the uh, they made they created the 7-eleven or the unlv ones you know and yeah. i th i think of that differently i wouldn't get those nike by you's you know I i'd rather have the actual dunk with the 7-eleven on it but I, I don't know i guess you're right when it comes to new balance I love the collab and I love the Slahey stuff too. And I would probably oh, get yeah. probably get both of them. <laughs> well, I feel I feel the same way about Nike too. Like I'm not so I'll give you the perfect example. Like um when they brought the the Air Max 97 back, they did the the Tokyo, they did like a it was like a Japan colorway, right? Which is like all green. And then it had the yellow infrared air, you know, air unit but they only did it in women's sizing. So it stopped at like a 10 and a half or something. And like, I'm a 13, so I couldn't get that shoe. So when they brought the Air Max 97 to Nike by you, you could do that very same colorway and actually, you know, create it. And I didn't because, you know, I just have too many Air Max 97s, but it wouldn't matter to me. Like I, like I'm going for the look. I don't care about like the name. I don't care that it's this limited pair. I care about the colorway. And I think for a lot of shoes, like that's that's kind of the way I feel. Like the Travis Scott ones and the Mochas, right? We were kind of talking about them before. Like if I bought the Mochas, if I had the Mochas, sadly I don't. Um, but if I had them, I don't necessarily feel like I would have the same need for like the Travis Scott ones right like for me they're they're somewhat interchangeable if i had the travis scott ones i'm not going to buy the mochas and and vice versa like because i'm because i have so many shoes that it, it doesn't make any sense for me to to have both because i'm not going to be able to wear you know one in a situation where i can't wear the other one so i might as well just you know have one and it sort of does does double duty makes Zach, sense. what's what's your desert island shoe yeah don't think you can get away <laughs> with the new balance i don't know you guys are putting it as no this. it doesn't have to be a new balance i know uh that's a good question i guess without being too loyally and saying it depends on this uh uh i'll go with the dave and busters <laughs> dave and busters island i'm gonna go with the pair of yeezys man the question is which ones i just love the comfort of the yeezy it's such a shoe that i could wear every single day you know uh i'll go with the we'll go with either the v1 or i'll even go with the beluga one of my favorite v2s very good call good call all right can i i think i just want to say one thing i think uh kanye is one of the greatest sneaker icons of all time but i gotta say as far as rappers that make sneakers you gotta go with pharrell over kanye in my opinion what Oof. what Oof. I, I love, love pharrell's yeah sneakers man <laughs> he has a wider sneakers. he has a wider catalog he has a bigger catalog than kanye does like yeah. if you want something he, he you know pharrell probably made something all right so how about travis scott where does travis scott rank i'm not a fan of the travis i i agree with what dave said you know i have the mochas and i didn't go out and get the the air j one high travis scott i like him and i you know i'll get some of his shoes and i have some but he doesn't he doesn't do it to me i'm more of a fan of designers like i'd rather get a salehi uh new balance because i appreciate his design and everything that he does there instead of just a name uh yeah. for an artist and, a and it might yeah. be you know it depends the person though the travis yeah. doesn't do it 
Travis, I, I, the problem with Nike is that it's it's Nike. It still it still it looks like the same shoe all the time. Like the Salehis for New Balance, that was that's something that was something that popped. The two thousand two is it's a unique silhouette, and he, the way that he used the colors on it with the materials, it's just you know it, it was something that looked new to me. It was a, it was a new direction, whereas uh, every time how many how many how many different jordans can you you know turn the swish around on you know like <laughs> travis went to new balance or travis went to puma would that make a difference i hope it would be a, a six I, i'm i'm all i have no brand loyalty like that's that's my thing i have no brand loyalty i, I if, if pharrell were to go to puma i would love it i, I would i would absolutely love it Oof. i mean i that's that's a brand that I, that i've been sleeping on for a while i think also because quality at the end of the day is a big concern for me but Puma is doing some interesting things with uh, with with their, their their new releases. I know Dave, you're a big fan of the Dreamers. Um, I don't have a pair yet, though. Yeah, and where are your where are your thirteen hundreds? <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. No, I, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Uh, Ald is is on my is on my shit list right now. They just. Ugh. Uh, one day, man. One day. Yeah, one day. We'll see. One day. Well, you know, by, by the time Teddy is, uh, he's the new director. You'll you'll have you'll have your uh, your thirteen hundreds. Let's hope so. Let's hope so. better. Anyway, I'm sorry. I I, I kind of sidetracked everybody. I lost my train of thought too. <laughs> no, it's all good. It's all good. Um, so I just wanna. I have to. I have to take off in like a few minutes. But yeah. Any any last thoughts or any any anything you guys want to throw out there regarding customs and just um your thoughts regarding like maybe where things are going and what people need to be on the lookout for i i know zach you talked about the mosh you know the mosh shoes and i also pre-ordered a pair um i for me i feel like it's going in this direction of everyone wants to be very different and everybody wants to have this very unique thing. And so um, that is pushing people to not necessarily just go for whatever Nike throws at them. And so that is probably a big part of why customs have popped and why there's all of this attention towards Warren Lotus. Cause you know, like you said, Nike is deciding, Hey, I gotta, I gotta protect this brand because people are gonna leave so yeah. i'm just wondering what you're what you guys have as far as thoughts of where things are going and 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 what we should be on the lookout for you want to start it off eric or yeah i mean so i i think customs are not going away uh, i think customs are only going to be getting stronger i think the law should provide some protection for customs whether it be through legislation or the common law um i don't know that it does i i would say that the, the the more anybody who's looking to get into customs the more work that you do on your own and the more creative you are with what you're doing the better you're off you are um you know i think i don't think it's going away everybody wants to have everybody wants to create their own thing and that sneakers are no exception. And when you can't get into the design studios for New Balance or, or Nike, you end up taking things into your own hands and making your own. I have a pair of fly knit uh, shoes that I am 100% going to tie dye with Dave's help because I know you're kind of a tie dye man. I need I need to I need to tie dye these things. It's just killing me because I'm not crazy about them the way they are and I need to do something with them. But be creative, be fearless, and don't worry about it. And if you have any problems, you call me or you call Zach because we'll <laughs> be there for you. I promise. I promise. Seriously, you know the the law is can be rigid and inflexible, but that's why you have lawyers that know how to how to how to do what we do. And, and you know, I don't work with Zach, but he's he's a great attorney, and you can find him easily. And I, I'll pass it off to him so he can he can tell you all about the future as he sees it yeah we don't work with me yet but we've talked and trust me there will be some times but <laughs> i'm gonna need some more litigation help <laughs> yeah but uh but yeah i mean 
I think, you know, Eric, Eric's is exactly right. Customs aren't going away. Uh, and it's still a question of what is a custom? You know, what is it? Is it one dot? Is it two dots? Is it a lot? You know, and it all comes down to creativity to me. And that's really why I, you know, my, you heard my background with my family and everyone uh, and how I work with creatives. And that's why I love what I do and why I work with creatives because they're different. And all these big brands exist and already, and everyone's looking to make their own shoe or make their own brand. And I get comments a day about, hey, how can I differentiate myself or do this? And the, the best practices I can give you is be creative, be yourself. Uh, yeah, you could take an Air Jordan 1 silhouette and put your logo on it, but you know, there's, there's risks associated with that stuff. So the more creative you are in regards to your own brand, your own logo, your own silhouette, your own shoe, the better you're going to be just like Mache and that custom that we did. I mean, that's awesome. You know, it's an impressionist painting on, on a shoe in a way. And a lot of other people are doing similar things. Shoe surgeon is, is standing out there uh, by doing crazy creative, different stuff that separate himself from Nike and all other people. So that avoids legal confusion. So it, it is a tricky area of law, but you know, be creative, be you. And if you have any questions, just like Eric said, don't be afraid to ask attorneys because it's the most important thing to ask questions. And what I've noticed, and it's the same thing when me and Eric are friends and how he reached out to me is because the sneaker industry, a lot of people don't ask questions. They don't really know what the law is. I mean, as an attorney, I sometimes don't know what the law is. I have to look it up and call people like Eric and ask. So it, it can be tricky. And if you have any questions, don't be afraid to ask because the Nikes and the, the big companies are very litigious. And it's always better to build a brand on something that you own instead of having to come back and get in trouble and start a whole new brand. Yeah. Uh, Chinatown Market, uh, obviously different experience, different issues, but you know, it's tough to rebrand what I'm saying. Yeah. So ask questions and, you know, just be you, be different. Yeah. Cool. I think, I think you guys gave us a lot of great information today. Um, you know, I don't think people look at it from the legal perspective often. Um, and myself, like, you know, I can't afford a shoe surgeon sneaker at this point, but eventually that's a goal. So I want to make sure that I'm within, within the legal realm of not getting like sued or chased down by Nike. Um, yeah. But it's it's always very interesting to sort of hear where we think the line is, or at least where lawyers think the line is, um, and uh, and see and see how that stacks up to real life. Um, but it's been great talking with both of you. We got to have you guys back. Maybe we can not talk so much legalese and go into 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 more desert island talk, <laughs> and uh, you know see see what's going on. Uh, with your collections in the future um, but but thanks so much for spending you know an hour and some time with me and um, hopefully we'll talk soon definitely definitely Our, my pleasure man yep. yeah thanks for having us man it was awesome it was great to meet you to talk everything so definitely Absolutely. Be back. we'll Absolutely. be back with uh with the next time like he files a, files a lawsuit. <laughs> yeah i can't wait i can't wait right, you right now watch so next see. week <laughs> Take it easy, guys. All right, man. Later.